Without question, the Flood represents the greatest threat to biodiversity in the galaxy. Whether it was wise for the Fauners to have exacted galaxy-spanning genocide in order to save future generations may be debated, yet such luxuries only exist now because of Halo. At present, the parasite has been kept at bay, but it is uncertain how long this will remain. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and just a couple of things before we get into today's video focusing on the Flood. I have just finalised the most recent batch of Patreon perks for patrons of Installation 00, and my patrons have received a tasty array of merch over their tenure, including t-shirts, mugs, mini prints, hoodies, collectibles, oddball skulls, replica indexes, Forerunner Energy Fusion Coil Power Banks, Pillar of Autumn Statues, Cortana Chips, and much, much more. Now, unfortunately, you've missed out on all of those awesome perks, but we are now at a refresh point. All of the merch is now being refreshed for the next batch of Patreon Fulfilled and Installation 00 Fulfilled merch, which I cultivate from across the internet, both things that I create myself and things that other people across the community who are extraordinarily talented have created that I bring together and get sent out to you guys for helping to support the channel. So if there's any time to jump aboard as a new patron for Installation 00, now is the time. That's all I wanted to say on that, and now let's return to the true focus of today's video. The Lovecraftian horror of the Halo universe, The Flood. The Flood constitutes a peril to life in the galaxy that remains largely unequaled. It is an omni-parasitic species that seemingly originated beyond the borders of foreigner civilization, and was the reason for the creation of Halo, the foreigner's weapon of last resort, specifically designed to eradicate all thinking life. The Flood is a ravenous hive mind parasite that aggressively and relentlessly seizes, converts, and controls sentient hosts in an effort to propagate and spread into every possible space. When infected, individuals have their nervous systems completely subormed by the parasite, turning their bodies into puppets while their memories are assimilated and exploited to further the infestation. Each new host is then linked to existing ones in a distributed intelligence based on the transcendent science of neural physics. This allows for interstellar coordination and the formation of increasingly sophisticated consciousness nodes that eventually manifest a meta-intelligence known as a grave mind. The Flood have one singular goal, the infection and transformation of all life in the galaxy into an undifferentiated mass of biomatter, with every sentient being consumed and absorbed by the grave mind. As the foreigners learned, the Flood cannot be reasoned with, swayed by threats, or manipulated. The only viable solution in the end was Halo, and what was effectively a galaxy-spanning genocide of all sapient organisms. The Flood did not arise naturally, but were created as a tool and a weapon by the last of an ancient and powerful species thought to be wiped out millions of years ago through an act of treachery committed by the foreigners. The precursor's final breath was one of ancient reciprocity, slowly grown in the vengeful heart of the primordial, a bizarre ancient creature found in stasis within a ruined planetoid. It was only later revealed to be the last of its kind after the Fauners had annihilated the Precursors in the shadowy reaches of Path Cthona. Although the Flood's origins were first presumed to have been discovered by ancient humans in a strange dust stored within enigmatic, derelict vessels at the edge of the galaxy, it was the Primordial's haunting disclosure that held the truth. The Parasite was the elegant handiwork of the Precursors, 
the punitive infestation that followed gripped the galaxy without any mercy. As a product of madness and despair, the Flood are nightmares given form, unrelentingly devoted to merging all living things into one. Flood hosts are transmuted from their original form by resilient and adaptable flood supercells, which can be configured into immense variety of combinations. These cells are most often grafted onto the hosts to augment their native physical capabilities, but amalgamations of flood supercells can also be used to create mockeries of living creatures comprised of this same purpose-built bone, bile, and flesh. In later stages, pure forms are manifested entirely from flood supercells, created to further the flood's expansion or fortify its existing domains. Given their parasitic nature, there is no known universal form of the flood. They express a singular intellect and purpose through countless physical permutations. Apart from their capacity to absorb the knowledge and abilities of those they infect, the greatest weapon of the Flood is its preternatural manipulation of ancient, esoteric elements of reality. Powerful, neural physical brains inherited from the precursors and leveraged to effect untold destruction on a stellar scale, as was the case with the Star Roads and the loss of the Greater Ark. The Flood have no formal culture and would more accurately be considered a single macro-organism instead of a group of individuals or even a group of sub-sapient individuals controlled by a greater intelligence. For all intents and purposes, every Flood cell in the galaxy is part of a singular, larger body and intellect known as the grave mind. The conscious control that the grave mind can exert on its lesser components is limited, but all are inescapably connected through neural physical links, and its will is made manifest through the creation of specialized key minds that coordinate local flood. Their society, if it may be called that, most closely resembles an idealized social utopia as there is no wealth, no poverty, no want, no crime, and no conflict. Every individual works for the advancement of the Flood as a whole. The Flood see all life as either food or vectors for further infection. There may be situations in which the grave mind needs to temporarily cooperate or debate with sapient creatures in order to achieve a goal, but such events are conspicuous exceptions. In these rare instances, the grave mind may construct unimpeachable logical arguments couched in eons old philosophical observations that are designed to erode resistance and manipulate the prejudices and fears of its target. The Grave Mind also seems to enjoy broadcasting the inevitability of its victory to all through infected hosts and infiltrated communication channels in order to spread terror and chaos and thereby weaken the resolve of its enemies. In all cases, its ultimate purpose is clear and unambiguous. The total absorption of all thinking life in the galaxy, eradicating all diversity into a single, consummate entity, which now holds a vast, immeasurable reservoir of knowledge and history. There are no accounts of the time before the Precursors, and even their civilization was relegated to myth and legend at the time of the Foreigners. Holding firmly the mantle of responsibility, the Precursors had created and safeguarded many species in the galaxy, known as Path Tolgrith, eons before any muttering of the name the Milky Way. And these created and safeguarded species included both the Foreigners and humanity. When they had determined to grant humans the right to inherit the mantle, 
the foreigners turned on their makers, driving them to the edge of the galaxy and beyond, to Path Cathona. The genocide that followed destroyed all but a handful of the precursors. By the Gravemind's account, the surviving few fled into the dark expanse between Path Cathona and Path Tolgroth. Most of these perished. The dust of their remains, a pale, desiccated powder, was collected into capsules and hidden aboard starships abandoned to the desolation of space. What was believed to have been the very last precursor, consumed by an insatiable hunger for revenge, managed to transmute itself into a form that could survive millions of years. This timeless being would become known as the Primordial, locking itself away on a dead world at the edge of Path Tolgroth. It entered deep hibernation, enduring long ages before its purpose would ultimately be realized. The first emergence of the Flood occurred near the ancient human civilization and their allies, the San Shayum. Stumbling upon these bizarre derelict ships, humanity secured their capsules and the curious dust within. While the ships and their contents were studied for years, it was eventually discovered that the powder could induce desirable mutations in some creatures, including a common human pet called the Faru. For centuries, this modification was embraced by pet owners, and though it seemed entirely innocuous on the surface, an extreme genetic transformation was taking place underneath. Soon, human exploration also came upon the Primordial, extracting it from a lifeless planetoid and bringing it to their greatest holdfast, the precursor world of Charum Hakor. Impassive, inscrutable, and unlike anything they had ever encountered before, the humans referred to this creature as the captive keeping it contained within a time-lock prison. After years of observation, they eventually discovered how to awaken and communicate with the creature. Despite their probing, they could only invoke cryptic and seemingly useless responses, though eventually, these became frighteningly lucid. The first signs of the parasite appeared on human worlds where the Faru had been treated with the strange powder. What began as an aesthetically pleasing patch of fur mutated into strange, mysterious growths, and the affected Faru began to attack and devour their own kind. What became known as the Shaping Sickness eventually started to manifest in humans virulently spreading and dramatically altering their behavior before sending entire worlds into chaos. By the time local governments could respond, dozens of planets were already devastated, their inhabitants twisted and reshaped into various forms, driven to attack, consume, and absorb. Those infected escaped all efforts at containment, spreading to new worlds and placing human civilization into jeopardy. When the captive was asked about the shaping sickness, the answers were so shocking that many of the researchers who heard them committed suicide. There is a link in the description on my theories on exactly what was spoken about. Others probed deeper, interrogating the creature, which seemed to have some connection to the plague. Unaware that the primordial itself had direct influence on the disease, the humans became its unwitting pawns as it slowly evolved the sickness into an unstoppable force. No longer was it a mindless infection, but the disease had now become a dark, parasitic tide known as the Flood. Armed with wisdom gleaned from the primordial, yet driven by utter desperation, the humans believed they had found a solution to the Flood. A third of humanity would have to be sacrificed. Their altered bodies, tragically placed in the parasite's path to infect the Flood itself with a destructive set of programmed genes. Followed by military strikes and orbital bombardment, 
the enemy finally seemed to be eradicated within their civilization. But reservoirs of the Blight were soon detected on fauna worlds along their borders. The humans swiftly assaulted these sites, trying to halt the parasite's resurgence, which roused the Fauna Empire and its indomitable military strength in the process. The Ecumene Council soon authorized war against the humans, deploying the full extent of their forces to stop this unforeseen enemy. This conflict lasted for half a century, with humans effectively fighting a war on two fronts, both the Flood and the Foreigner. The war's final battle took place on Charum Hakor, the last remaining human stronghold. Although the Foreigners knew of the Flood, its presence seemed to suddenly retreat, many believing that the humans had developed a cure. For centuries, the Foreigners would prepare for the Flood's return, their primary efforts focused on Halo, a galaxy-spanning weapon network that would eradicate not only the Flood, but the very sentient hosts it needed to propagate. When the Flood finally returned, the Foreigners met the Parasite headlong, in a terrible and unprecedented war that lasted three centuries. Many years later, Charum Hakor was chosen by those building Halo as the test site for the weapon, inadvertently releasing the primordial in the process. Retrieving this strange specimen and placing it on one of the ring worlds, its interrogation was entrusted to mendicant bias, an ancilla that had been given full authority over the foreigner's defenses against the flood. Over time, the primordial opened up to the prodding of mendicant bias but only to turn and twist its jailer's own questions, testing the Ancilla's logic and loyalty. After 43 years, the creature eventually broke the shackles of the artificial mind, compelling the Ancilla towards its own purposes against the foreigners and seeking to execute its long-awaited revenge. Fully persuaded by the Primordial's goals, Mendicant Bias turned against the foreigners siding with the Flood as it continued to ravage the galaxy. Striking the Fauna's capital with the Halo Weapon Network, Mendicant Bias effectively severed the head of Fauna power before seizing one of the Ringworlds and narrowly escaping. As the Ecumene reeled from the loss of its leadership, the Flood surged onto millions of worlds. Although it was pressed on all sides, the Fauna military managed to retake the Rogue Halo capturing Mendicant Bias and destroying the Primordial. By then, however, it was too late. The Primordial had already resurrected itself as the Gravemind, a powerful compound intelligence that could lead the Flood in its merciless spread. Much of the galaxy was now deemed part of the Burn, designated sectors formerly replete with wonderfully diverse life, now seething beds of infestation hordes clawing out from grotesque hives and belching from long-tended spore stacks. The Fauners ultimately fled to the extragalactic Ark, the foundry of the Halo. And here, they solemnly activated the weapon network, destroying the Flood throughout the entire galaxy, as well as all species that could sustain it. In the years that followed, the few foreigners who survived repopulated the galaxy with the preserved forms of species that had been decimated by Halo, and prepared heavily secured installations, including sites on the ring worlds themselves, to continue research on the parasite, hoping that one day, a cure would be discovered. When their work was finished, these foreigners fled the galaxy in exile, leaving behind only traces of their civilization in the powerful machines and facilities which remained on numerous worlds. A hundred millennia later, incited by these same curious artifacts, the Covenant was created, a religious alliance that mistook the foreigners' weapons as keys to spiritual transcendence. Its members sought to activate Halo in order to attain divinity. During the Covenant's efforts, they stumbled upon humanity 
an encounter which resulted in a war that lasted three decades. This conflict came to a head on one of the Halo Rings when the Covenant inadvertently released the Flood from a containment site, suddenly imperiling the galaxy once more and forcing humanity to destroy the installation. However, the war continued, surging across yet another ring world where a grave mind had already been formed due to an earlier containment breach. This infestation eventually reached the Covenant's homeworld of High Charity, where the grave mind began plotting to eliminate its sole threat, Halo. Harnessing all of its power and traveling to the Ark installation, the grave mind found the Covenant desperately seeking to activate the rings. Working alongside humanity, the Parasite managed to stop the Covenant's efforts before it was too late. This alliance, however, was short-lived, as the Gravemind immediately turned on the humans, forcing them to activate an unfinished ring that could eradicate the local infestation and stop the Flood yet again, though without endangering the galaxy. While this act catastrophically damaged the Ark and scoured the Parasite from its surface for a time, the threat of the Flood was not yet averted. Hidden within the devastated remains of High Charity, a vestige of the Flood still festers in the shadows. The Ark's security systems presently keep the Parasite at bay, though its insidious presence is patiently waiting for an opportunity to emerge onto the galactic stage once again. Without a key mind to direct their activities, the Flood act as simple predators, seeking out new hosts using pack tactics, but dominated by instinct alone. Feral Flood are extremely dangerous and fast-spreading, typically overwhelming opposition with sheer numbers and brute force. During this time, Flood supercell spores are generated to spread the Flood's corruption by converting any available biomass into new infection forms and other mobile vectors. Insisted flood cells form chitinous spores, which can remain dormant for centuries. When a spore arrives in a favorable environment or becomes attached to a potential food source, it becomes active. Spores can parasitize both sapient and non-sapient species, consuming them and transforming their biomass into egg-like incubators for larger, more mobile flood infection forms. Infection by flood spores is a gruesome fate, for which there is no cure or inoculation, no treatment to slow the parasite's growth, and no reversal of its transformation. The only effective countermeasure is containment and incineration. The flood's only desire is to expand and corrupt. Once enough biomass is available, the parasite can establish layers for defense and the growth of specialized forms. These layers are usually repurposed spaces, for the flood does not build when it can only infest instead. These tumorous blights are the most obvious targets for attack and cleansing, but they are simply a symptom of flood infestation, not its cause. The foreigners recognize this distinction far too late after countless sterilization missions resulted in empty victories. The appearance of the first key mines mark the transition to the second stage of flood infestation. At this point, the parasite's goals shift from simple expansion to the accumulation of neural tissue and biomass for the creation of larger hives and higher order compound mines. Combat and carrier forms under the direction of a key mind are cunning and capable of tactical maneuvers, in addition to making more effective use of the tools and weapons of their original hosts. This new level of capability includes the operation of vehicles, ambush tactics, and the sourcing of ammunition. Combat form bodies in the coordinated stage also become progressively more warped as they are remodeled with flood supercell appendages to increase mobility and lethality. Once victory is assured on a given world, the bodies of those who perish fighting the flood and damaged combat forms are recovered and used to feed massive flood supercell growths that blanket former population centers. 
The largest of these are spore towers that rise into the sky in great peaks, symbols of the Flood's victory and engines of destruction that choke all remaining life as it marshals its new strength to spread and grow on further worlds. When a grave mind has been fully established, the Flood Infestation will make efforts to leverage any technology and knowledge available to its larger consciousness and leave their current domain in search of others to infect. Though the Flood prefers to utilize existing transportation technology when possible, the Grave Mind is a depthless well of knowledge who can adapt many long-lost secrets of space travel to local situations. Eventually, if left unchecked, thousands of interstellar stage collectives and their Grave Mind avatars will coalesce, spiraling around the galaxy in a harmonized pattern that ensures that no habitable planet goes uninfected. The parasite's goal at that point is unknowable, but may have something to do with their origins, the precursors themselves, that has been hinted, though not explicitly stated, that may serve as a cyclical pattern of birth, growth, advancement, harvesting, consumption and death, and then rebirth. Ships taken over by the Flood are reinforced by chitinous Flood supercell growths and transformed into nightmarish hives that spread the parasite across the stars. The Flood is careless with its resources and often simply crash infected ships straight into the heart of their enemies allowing the festering monsters and clouds of spores within to surge out and consume everything they touch. The Grave Mind unlocked the Precursor's secret roads across the galaxy for the Flood's use. These corridors through esoteric spaces allowed its plague fleets to bypass foreign defenses and crush their largest fortifications. Star roads function as pathways woven between dimensions built with strange matter and neural physical links which were obliterated when the halo fired. Their extraordinarily resilient and powerful brain composition allows those who wield them the ability to manipulate immense objects at a stellar scale, easily tearing starships apart and pummeling planets and moons into debris. The vast regions of space completely under flood domination were referred to as burns by the forerunners. Deemed unrecoverable, worlds within these quarantine zones were subject to total sterilization wherever possible. Their continents burned to molten slag and their oceans boiled by orbiting fleets, a last ditch measure to deny the Flood any resources. By the end of the Flood War, much of Path Tolgrith was designated as burn by the retreating fauna military. Flood infection forms are nightmarish creatures spawned in extraordinary numbers for the singular purpose of converting all living creatures into carriers, tools, or food for the parasite. They come in countless sizes and forms that may crawl, climb, fly, swim, and dig their way through an environment towards fresh victims, whether viable hosts or raw sustenance. Although barely intelligent on their own, once infection forms infiltrate and take control of a sentient creature with sufficient neural complexity, they can easily turn the victim's cognitive power to the furtherance of the Flood's goals, sifting through its memories for any data that can be plied to benefit the propagation of the parasite at large. All infection forms share several key morphological traits across their variations, each suited for subduing and subverting any available organic targets. The most commonly encountered infection forms have a frond-like array, which acts as the creature's sensory system, stemming from soft, pod-shaped bodies filled with noxious gases that allow them to bound over the ground and obstacles at surprising speeds. Tentacle-like appendages are equipped with barbs that can latch onto a target's body, 
even cutting through armor or environmental suits if necessary. When the target is compromised, infection forms inject flood cells to suborn the victim's nervous system, as the infiltration form itself bores into the host's body to hollow out a nest, quickly twisting the remains of its victim into a combat or carrier form. Once a hive is established, massive numbers of infection forms can be produced, spreading out in search of new creatures to infect. Both ground and airborne infection forms often function as living weapons, hurling themselves at the enemy to overwhelm even the most comprehensive defences. Though visibly distinct from the crawling forms generally associated with the parasite, the flood's simplest vectors are spores, astonishingly resilient creatures that can take a number of shapes depending on their existing environment. These small, elegant forms are able to remain inactive for even hundreds of years, slowly adapting to their environs, waiting with unending patience for a potential food source to arrive. Once a spore is adequately fixed to a suitable target, whether sapient or not, it will quickly begin to transform any existing biomass into flood supercell surrogates. While keeping its victim alive, the spore violently and excruciatingly moulds its subject into a fleshy crash of egg-like incubators, an essential step in the creation and dissemination of larger infection forms designed explicitly for the environment they have adapted to. Non-sapient animals or mangled corpses deemed unfit for being harnessed into larger combat forms are seeded with flood cells and quickly transformed into sacs filled with infection forms and membranes that function as incubation chambers for the development of spores. These festering growths pose a monumental threat to even the most seemingly isolated regions of an infected world, harboring the potential to transform an entire planet's biosphere into desolate, diseased hellscapes if left unchecked, devoid of any prospect for restoration. Blisters can exist in any shape that best fits the environment they are created in, though most are pale, sickly coloured ovoid bulbs that distend from the flood's existing membrane and can vary dramatically in size. Upon the establishment of a self-sufficient hive, the parasite will immediately begin to produce larger numbers of diverse infection forms, unequivocally designed to accommodate the environment they find themselves in. These forms will voraciously spread out in search of creatures to infect or feed upon, able to traverse a world through land, air, and even water. Cedars perfectly embody this diversity, as lighter-than-air infection forms that soar through the sky to seek out prey and coordinate strikes against any resisting the parasite's spread. Cedars gather into immense swarms, creating dense, living barriers that are able to effectively defend the flood's expansion from aerial threats. Dispersal pods are living drop pods, grown to be disposable containers for flood combat forms, pure forms, and spore clouds. They shield their cargo during orbital insertions and burst apart on impact, often deployed from a flood-infected vessel down onto a world's surface. Dispersal pods can also be expelled from ground-based hives using a directed discharge of built-up gases to propel them across great distances and into targeted territory. These pods are one of the key infection vectors utilized by flood during its interstellar stage, plague ships quickly seeding worlds with the parasite without ever even needing to set down. Once a host is infected, they become a combat form, aiding the flood in securing other hosts and collecting biomass and neural tissue to establish key mines. In this form, the host's body remains relatively intact, yet under the control of an infection form that has nested within it. Although sections of the host's body are consumed and converted into flood supercells, some limbs and sensory organs are retained to utilize available weapons, tools, vehicles, equipment, and even ships. The infection form does augment its new body and repair minor damage to better serve as a living weapon, but ultimately every combat form is utterly disposable, even as they insatiably search out new victims to subdue. Combat forms are covered in spore-filled polyps and much of their internal organs are in the process of being consumed and replaced 
with flood supercell accretions that function as support lattices, protecting a sickly green liquid that contains flood spores in suspension. Ironically, damage incurred by this form scatters small chunks of infected flesh and distributes it in the environment, aiding the flood in spreading its influence. The flood form that controls the body sees the environment using its own sensory organs and whatever remains of the host's native senses are usually redundant and ignored. The active sensory organs often take the form of flexible fronds or antennae on the end of narrow tendrils. There are as many variations of combat forms as there are hosts, though most of these fall within specific parameters allowing loose and overlapping categories for each kind. The most basic combat form is simply called an attacker. While the infection form driving the host's body does not feel pain or fear, the same cannot be said for the host. In some circumstances, the infection form is unable to completely dominate the original personality of the victim, and the victim remains fully aware of their irrevocable transformation and their being used as a tool for the parasite. Though their bodies are bent to the flood's will, occasionally the victim can still whisper for mercy or cry out in pain. More often the parasite will speak on their behalf, using stolen thoughts and memories as a psychological weapon, terrorizing both the host and anyone unfortunate enough to be within earshot. Although many non-sapient animals suborned by infection forms are not capable of being fully exploited by the flood, some can be marshaled as combat forms in the early stages of infiltration and expansion if they bear sufficient neurocomplexity. Broadly characterized as thrashers, these hulking vicious creatures are simple weapons. They have limited intellects and grossly distorted bodies that conceal whip-like barbed tentacles and toothy maws that gorge on flesh to fuel their rampage. Bearing a vague reminiscence to some pure forms, the Thrasher is employed mainly to eradicate any threat to an existing hive. The large, blistered monstrosities hovering ominously from one victim to another is often called the Bomber, pouring out fetid blisters full of spores and pods onto its target. Originated from a pseudo-cephalopod that travelled in the air through the use of gas bladders, the parasite quickly discovered that rather than converting it to spore-packed blisters as with many other non-sapient lifeforms, the creature could be used to incubate and distribute infection pods and spores, effectively seeding enemy territories from above. This particular creature bears a strange and haunting shape with a large flesh-mound mouth and long finger-like tendrils horrifying sight that stops victims in their tracks. Certain predatory avian creatures with adequate calcium reserves and resilient neurosystems may also be infected and transformed into flying combat forms. Despite their large size, swarm forms are remarkably swift and capable of launching highly sophisticated coordinated attacks on enemies from the air, an aspect which earned them their name. Not only can they fire infectious barbed projectiles at enemies, but they can use razor-sharp talons and teeth to gouge and rend their prey into pieces. As is the case in some other forms, the parasite may limit overall flood supercell modification on specific hosts to minimize resource loss. Damaged combat forms and infected creatures who have outlived their usefulness but retain some mobility are transformed into mobile incubation chambers for new infection forms. What remains are bloated creatures whose entire body is converted to serve this new purpose. Filled with noxious and volatile gases, carrier forms throw themselves at the enemy to explosively release the newborn infection forms roiling within them. There are two types of carrier forms, converted and demoted. Converted carriers are hosts with little offensive potential, transformed into this form immediately while demoted carriers are combat forms that have been damaged beyond utility. As the flood consume and convert everything in its path, a lack of potential hosts will limit its ability to create new infected victims. However, with the conversion of the environment and the existence of centralized intelligence, the flood can spontaneously generate new forms entirely 
from flood supercells and the salvaged biomass of their defeated foes. The variety of forms that these creatures take is vast and nearly impossible to effectively catalogue, as many of these can spontaneously transform to another configuration in response to new threats. The most common iteration of a pure form is the Shifter, a shape-changing monster created for the purpose of direct assaults and the support of existing combat forms. These can most commonly transition between three separate configurations during combat, all in response to the Flood's most immediate needs. In many ways, this form reflects a central facet of the Parasite's ultimate goal. Shifters are an undifferentiated dynamic mass of Flood supercell that can spontaneously adjust into specialized functions in order to accommodate its present purposes. The shifter is most often found near newly established flood hives, synergistically using its native born environment to fiercely protect the layer from any perceived threat until larger pure forms can be created. When mobility is needed, the shifter will transform into a stalker configuration. Its body sits horizontally, resting atop two spindly wide set legs, and its two long arms end in remarkably strong claws. Shifters in this configuration can travel very quickly, even on vertical surfaces, and jump great distances. The shifter will usually transform to a new configuration once it locates an enemy and can find an angle to engage it. Its ranged configuration resembles a large pod-like creature with two hind legs and a single multi-pronged forelimb. This form can launch razor-sharp calcified spikes at potential threats from a large abdomen segment which rests atop its body. Ranged forms cannot move, but will affix themselves in areas that have good vantage points for attack. For frontal assaults, the shifter can transform into a hulking tank configuration, balancing the mobility of the stalker with the aggression of the ranged form as it wars against anything that threatens the hive. Although this bipedal giant can only lumber slowly from one location to another on ungainly trunk-like legs, its arms are enormous, scything bludgeons that can cause extraordinary damage. The tank form is no more lethal than other pure forms, though the mere sight of it strikes fear in the heart of any foolish enough to intrude upon its domain. Combat multipliers for the Flood's strategic advance, the Gaunt leverage their fused intellects to serve as elite assassins and independent agents of the Parasite. Gaunts are incredibly agile and mobile, using their whip-like arms as both weapons and tools to traverse the environment. They rarely engage in any conflict with even odds, preferring to stalk from the shadows accompanied by hordes of infection forms. Gaunts tactically subdue key enemies, absorbing them into the Flood's consciousness in order to reveal hidden strategies and glean countermeasure plans. Few survive this creature's astonishing speed and savagery. Pure forms called Spawners quickly gestate new infection forms in their disease brood sacs. Highly mobile and capable of independent action, these creatures may lurk at the rear of larger Flood assaults to spawn fresh waves of infection forms, but, in most cases, they range far from their birth hives to establish new reservoirs of flood parasites in the most remote areas. As the flood invokes dominion over a territory, spawn has become an essential facet of its expansion, spreading the parasite's horrific influence as far as physically possible. Specialising in cracking open vehicles and converting their crew into flood-controlled puppets, the Infester is a viciously aggressive element of flood-dominated terrain. When it detects any mechanized prey, the infester grabs onto it with its tentacles and bores into the hull to reach the crew. As a purpose-built biological weapon, infestors expend all their energy on attacking before collapsing in a dying heap and spreading spores upon the completion of their singular task. The parasite often utilize this form strategically to force enemies to move on foot, a foolish misstep which always proves disastrous. Bitter monuments of pulsating flood supercells vaguely reflecting the majesty of the grave mind. Hellions are engines of desecration that form to overwhelm the most stalwart planetary holdouts. In their ever-changing shape, they serve the flood not as a key mind, but as a mobile hive and siege machine, 
able to incubate and shelter massive numbers of smaller parasites, rending and refashioning its flesh and bone into a living weapon aimed at any defences that attempt to stall the Flood's unyielding spread. As Flood infestation grows in strength, it begins to harvest complex neurotissue to weave into biological networks that augment their collective intelligence and allow synchronization between disparate groups. The appearance of these key mind collectives typically indicates that most local animal life and sentient hosts have been infected or consumed. The first key minds to appear take the form of multiple infected who are crudely grafted together into a biological network cluster. Widely varied in size and appearance, these nodes of consciousness are dedicated to the control of lesser forms, many terminating into three powerful categories. The appearance of key minds mark a sudden and dramatic shift in flood behavior from feral to coordinated. A massive key mind war form, the abomination brings order and direction to the lesser flood, turning feral parasites into a cunning and efficient collective. An evolved command form, these towering nightmares are used when standard hives cannot be established and the Flood must stay mobile to avoid detection and destruction. Given its enormous size and strength, the Abomination is extremely formidable, capable of decimating enemy fortifications and reducing mechanized defenses to smoldering debris with its massive tendrils. If multiple Abominations have focused on eliminating a stronghold, there is little hope for its survival, forcing those within to a deadly retreat often into gaping moors of lesser forms. Functioning as field commanders, the highly specialized pure form known as the Juggernaut makes use of multiple infected host minds to bend their intellect towards the analysis of enemy countermeasures and containment protocols, adjusting the local flood strategy accordingly. Despite their impressive mobility, they still bear the traits of a typical key mind, including the ability to synchronize nearby parasites and relay information between distant flood hordes, even if they are subservient to greater coordinated entities. Due to this strategic function, juggernauts prefer to avoid direct encounters but are fully cognizant of their status as high-value targets and will make use of their appearance to tactically draw the enemy into traps and feigns. Terrifying hunters, which ravenously scour the parasite's fetid hellscapes, Blightstalkers are pure forms that function as key mind coordinators in environments where no high intelligence hosts are available for assimilation and exploitation. They are large, aggressive predators haunting the shadows of Blightlands to seek out elusive sources of biomass, while providing a command node for local flood forces. Their speed and power make them remarkably dangerous, easily overcoming any who survived the first wave. Blightstalkers represent one of the most unquestionably terrifying and ravenous embodiments of the key mind. The Flood can survive and prosper in almost any environment, even airless voids in some situations, but Flood supercell growth and activity is optimal within a surprisingly narrow band of temperature and atmospheric composition. Fauna containment protocols allow the use of terraforming in environmental sculpting systems to be employed to combat the Flood most often executed by significantly dropping local temperatures to slow the parasite's growth. For its part, the Flood will seek to adjust local environmental factors in its favour immediately after reaching the coordinated stage. If not stopped, Blightlands are the result of uncontained Flood expansion, areas around established hives filled with Flood supercell growths and spore bodies, which harvest the vitality of the soil, soak up solar energy, and consume all native life within its boundaries. While this strange landscape flowers with a grotesque vitality, ultimately even these zones are themselves consumed to provide raw materials for city-sized spore towers, oceans of pulsating flood supercells, and colossal stacks of strange flood pseudo-organs that complete a planet's ruination. The apex of the flood is the grave mind. Many such entities can exist simultaneously, each a fount from which a single will can exert control on the galaxy through parasite-infected hosts. The grave mind considers itself many things. 
a monument of ancient sins and transgressions against the mantle of responsibility, a self-aware compound mind that transcends individual hosts and less evolved species, and a formless intellect who knows all the Flood have ever possessed. When the Flood expands in both dominion and influence within a given area, it begins to generate and collect large amounts of neurotissue, forming immense networks which exponentially extend its collective intelligence, allowing communication and interaction across vast distances. Using powerful, esoteric methods linked to neurophysics, the most stable and critical of these is the proto-grave mind. Although a single entity, the proto-grave mind may begin as a coalescent assemblage of vital intellect nodes in a location. These are typically infected individuals and sometimes even machines that contain the most useful data for the flood's propagation. Proto-grave minds vary in shape and size to some degree, but all are horrific amalgamations of beings merged into one another and anchored to the center of the flood's infestation, an entity which, unchecked, will eventually result in a grave mind. As the network of effect grows even further, the evolving mind can truly begin to manifest its will, directing its disparate components in the final steps needed to assemble a form large enough to house the full measure of its intellect. A grave mind is the height of the Flood's coordinated intelligences. Its vast knowledge, which includes memories, information and personalities, it has acquired over hundreds of thousands of years. This leaves lesser individuals with a sense that it is near omniscient, almost godlike. The grave mind brings its horrific form to peace through unification, a salvation which can only be rendered through assimilation. Its only goal is the consumption of every thinking creature in the galaxy. Each grave mind avatar is a fusion of flood supercell tissue with vast numbers of harvested neurosystems processing sufficient complexity the inevitable conclusion of a proto-grave mind. In essence, the grave mind is simply the composite mind that controls and directs the flood during infestations. Its local influence increases as the flood grows in number and creates specialized forms through which it can manifest its will. Although rare, multiple grave minds can exist simultaneously with overlapping spheres of control. Each grave mind is merely an avatar for a much greater intellect unique in form and task, but indistinguishable from each other in terms of personality and goals. Though strict protocols were enacted to eliminate or contain outbreaks, there were errors and lapses in judgement over the many centuries since the foreigners departed. One significant example was an outbreak on Delta Halo, which inexorably led to the formation of a grave mind. When the Covenant arrived at the doorstep of this ringworld, Toward the close of their war with the humans, this grave mind acted quickly, capturing the frigate in amber clad and using it to breach high charity. The massive station was soon converted into a putrid hive, assimilating its population into food and hosts for legions of new flood forms, seemingly guaranteeing its victory. However, after discovering an ancient fauna portal complex beneath Earth's surface, the Covenant had set in motion a plan to activate Halo from the Ark, threatening to end the grave mind's new freedom almost as soon as it has begun. In desperation and rage, the grave mind and its flood forces intercepted its foes at the Great Foundry, and quickly demolished almost all of what remained of the local Covenant, Sangheili, and human forces on the facility's surface. But victory was only fleeting, and the flood was soon defeated by a handful of human and Sangheili survivors who managed to fire the Ark's incomplete Installation 08, once again reducing the Grave Mind to a pale shadow of its full intellect. What remained of the Flood was soon contained within High Charity's wreckage by Sentinels and other automated systems. A few years later, the destruction of the Ark's monitor, 000 Tragic Solitude, slowed the installation's containment and excision operations, allowing the Covenant's former capital to continue to fester with a residual flood presence. As it may exist in the current era, the grave mind is but an echo of its earliest form, the primordial. 
the twisted and enigmatic precursor which single-handedly brought about the destruction of the foreigners was unlike anything the galaxy had ever seen. Even though it was ultimately destroyed by the isodidact on Installation 07 and reduced to ashes through an accelerated aging process within a stasis chamber, yet even that could not stop it. The primordial's consciousness had already been transferred into the flood, emerging as the grave mind and making the foreigners' defeat all but complete. Any grave mind that followed this event though merely reverberating manifestations of each other over the long ages, entertain the same knowledge and wisdom once held by the primordial, as if they were all one entity. While a single grave mind may not wield the same uncanny authority over neural physical brains as the primordial once did, the vast span of time since this arcane creature's death has given those that followed a greater store of knowledge than was ever possessed by what had come before. For this reason, the peril represented by a single grave mind should never be underestimated. Not only does the formation of a compound intelligence signal that a critical stage of the Flood's expansion has been reached, but also that it can govern with a level of authority that is dangerous at a galactic scale. When the grave mind's deep wells of knowledge are paired with access to superluminal transport, there is little that can stand in its way. When the Flood was first discovered during their war with humanity, no foreigners expected that their entire civilization would soon find themselves drawn into a perilous struggle for their very survival. Even then, however, many and varied endeavors were applied, conceived by the greatest minds the Akumin had ever produced, and led by the brilliant and indefatigable life shaper herself, the Librarian, Technologies long forsaken were revived. Extreme measures once thought too hazardous and profane to the mantle were carefully reconsidered. Nevertheless, there would be no clear and decisive solution to the flood achieved during the foreigners' time, except for their weapon of last resort. The first and most hopeful of all attempts to stem the flood was the possibility of a cure thought to have been achieved by the humans. During the final days of the foreigners' conflict with humanity, the parasite suddenly fled, receding untraceably to the dark edges of the galaxy. Early speculation led to the theory that humanity had discovered a cure. After the siege at Charam Hakor, many humans were composed for this very reason, their essences interrogated and evaluated for hidden secrets. The librarian herself seeded these essences into bodies of surviving humans, hoping that they would awaken and reveal the truth saving those who are now in danger. Despite such grand efforts, any cure discovered by the humans was lost to time, leading many to believe that there had never been one. Still, the foreigners would continue their research, even beyond the activation of Halo. During their three harrowing centuries of war, the foreigners saw few victories against the Parasite. Many of their weapons and combat platforms had to be dramatically modified to face this new foe, igniting rapid warfare development and even a return to an abandoned technology once thought to be too barbaric to use against living creatures. Weapons that employed hard light, plasma and directed energy were extensively explored, including those which could achieve complete disintegration of their living target, leaving no trace of the flood detectable. A myriad of fauna ancillas, drones and emplacements were soon equipped with powerful beam weapons capable of scorching away metal, bone and flesh. The sterilization methods worked in limited contexts, but the surging tide of the parasites saw little fatigue, often turning these weapons against their makers as they continued to take hosts from the fauna's own numbers. With their own warriors consumed by the flood, and tragically used against them, some strategists sought to find or forge soldiers impervious to infection, capable of infiltrating the parasite's strongholds and burning them to the ground without risk of compromise. Dangerous creatures such as the seething Thanolegolo and towering Sharkoi were initially considered both invulnerable to flood and devastating in large numbers, yet both too erratic and difficult to effectively employ. 
Machine soldiers like Armigers and Sentinels were also used in great numbers during the waning years of the war, but without the minds of warriors, they were far too predictable and relatively easy for the parasite to dispose of. Upon his return to the Ecumene, the Erdidact desperately sought to find a solution with the Composer, eventually resolving to transfer his own Promethean soldiers into powerful, weaponized bodies capable of breaching plague ships and grinding the Flood's advance to a halt. This was short-lived, however, as their numbers dwindled, forcing the Erdidact to use humans an act so reprehensible, it led to his own exile at the hands of his wife. Forced back on their heels, large swathes of the Ecumene, referred to as burns, were abandoned in retreat of the Flood's advance. Entire star systems filled with billions suffered premature supernovae to stunt the parasite's relentless movement toward even larger population centers, a ruthless firebreaking tactic developed by humans hundreds of years earlier. The final solution came in the form of Halo and its foil, the Shield Worlds, immense artificial refuges for populations escaping the parasite and capable of protecting sentient beings from the deadly blast. However, most of these sank below the rising deluge and became inaccessible in the final days of the Ecumene. After Halo was activated, automated research sites on the Ring Worlds and Shield Worlds would continue seeking a cure during the long ages to follow, employing extraordinary security protocols and quarantine contingencies if an outbreak were to ever occur again. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider hitting the subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Be sure to like the video if you did, and pop a comment below on what you'd like me to cover next. I just want to take a moment to thank my patrons, Spartan10148, the Metarch of my facility, Falcon, Sylphia, Mikhail, Ashley, Jordan, and Esoteric Sight, my dutiful monitors, Darian, Legions Lost, Lab Rat, Spartan0137, Jacob Kemp, Sean, Element Zero, J3, Mr. Keys, Gungslinger, Evermore, Personal Devil, Aldeas, Toxic, Scion Esports, Gem, Saber, and Relentless, my diligent submonitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, my loyal enforcers, and all other patrons who continue to support the channel. If you want your name on the end of the video and some perks earned along the way, head over to Patreon and consider supporting the channel yourself. Big shout out to my Tier 0 Transcendent YouTube members, Spartan137, Jacob Kemp, Talia, Fenrir, Bornstella, Jimbo, and Balaz, and all the other YouTube members keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy, with a special mention to the Accursed Hunter. Shout out to John due to the mathematical formula used to determine the area within a pentadodecahedron. <laughs> Oh, and Lena, because that sandwich. And <laughs> remember, there are tons of ways to support the channel and keep my installation pumping out content at a breakneck speed. Much love to you all, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.